Last summer, I confessed something to you as a congregation, that I was becoming increasingly anxious and angry. And as I looked at what would be causing that anxiety and anger, I found I was consuming more and more news content in one form or another. I'd turn on a left-leaning news show, and it would say, Republicans are coming for your money and are going to do an upward transfer of wealth. They're going to cancel all of you and turn you into all transsexual fur people. And I'd turn on left-leaning media, or the other side. I forgot which side I said first because I got caught up in my illustration there. <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. And it left you to, uh, the other way around, accusing all Republicans of being racists that wanted to literally put people in concentration camps. I was like, man, no wonder I am getting so anxious and angry all the time. Not only that, I had trouble figuring what was going on in the world. I had trouble figuring out what the facts were. As I dug a little deeper, I discovered something. In 2018, uh, Tucker Carlson, uh, the host of the number one show on the Fox News channel, was sued uh, uh, for say, making some false statements that were pretty demonstratively false. Um, and his legal defense by his legal team was the following, that no reasonable viewer would think that Carlson was, quote, stating actual facts about the topics he discussed. And he won. He didn't argue the facts of the case. They simply said, this is an entertainment product. No one should believe that what he says is necessarily true and reflect reflecting a reality. Then, in 2019, Rachel Maddow, the host of the number one a uh, show on MSNBC was sued for making a demonstratively false claim that could be proven in court. This is Rachel Maddow, if you don't know her. I actually met her. She was up in Massachusetts when I was a reporter up there. And her legal defense from her team from MSNBC said that no reasonable viewer would take her statements as factual. And actually, this is what it said. I read the decision in this because the decision just came down a month or so ago uh, from the judge. And the judge said that reasonable viewers would not take her statements as factual. Well, gee whiz, no wonder I'm having a hard time figuring out what's going around in the world. Because the networks themselves who are putting on these shows are saying Many of the news products that you, are concerning, or that you are consuming are not based on fact. They're for entertainment. Man, we are living in a difficult environment today. The world has gone crazy, and some days we can't even figure out how it's gone crazy. And as we consume more and more of this sensational and sometimes not quite truthful media, we as Christians are finding it harder and harder to operate in the world, and we're finding ourselves anxious and angry. And it's disrupting our faith, it's disrupting our trust in the Lord, and it's making it very confusing to decide how to react to the world around us. I can't tell you how many people have come up to me in the last year and said, Shane, I just don't know what to believe anymore. So today we're going to tackle this as part of our series, Don't Panic! And if you weren't here last week, I'm going to make you say don't panic when it's time for us to don't panic. But we're going to kind of walk through what is the environment that we are living in, both in traditional mu uh, media and in social media, and then look at, okay, what is the Christian response to this? How do we figure out what's going on? What is the thing that is going to keep us locked on the Word of God and God's will for our lives, living in the season of turmoil and apparent chaos? 
Before we do that, though, I want to address what we talked about last week, kind of do a little bit of a review, because we're doing three sermons in this series, Don't Panic, and they kind of build on one another, so let me remind you what we did last week. Last week, we talked about objective truth, that the Bible instructs us to view the world based on objective truth and objective morality. We talked about what objective truth was, that objective truth is the understanding that facts have a definite correspondence to reality, independent of the human mind, And that reality is knowable. Let's break that down real quick. That facts have a definite correspondence to reality. Believe it or not, the facts are true. They are what they are. They're not based on human perceptions necessarily, although that is how we all interpret the world. But there is an objective reality that exists. And it exists independent of the human mind. Right? So it's not just... Well, you saw this, so you believe this, and I saw this, so I believe this. Like, no, uh, independent of what we perceive and what we think about, things happen and exist. They use the example, if a tree falls in the woods, does it make a sound? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and last, that this reality is knowable. That doesn't mean we could know everything. There's some things that are very complicated. We're trying to figure them out. But in general, reality is not some impossible mystery. We could understand a whole Lot. And we talked about the fact that this kind of truth is in decay. It's kind of fallen apart. It's rotting from the inside out, which has led to an era of subjective truth and subjective morality. You believe your morality, and I believe my morality. But we talked about how that hurts people over the long term, either those who believe in that or based on their actions towards others. And I posited the shame theory of our current uh, dealings with truth in our society, that we've kind of bought into this, not, not all of us, but just, you know, I'm talking about our culture in general, this team-based reality. I'm going to believe what my team believes, and I'm going to believe against what the other team believes. And sometimes we're defining our beliefs based on what is opposite the others. So the, the other team does this, so I'm going to be the opposite of the other team, and I'm going to do this. Again, I'm overgeneralizing. I'm not saying all of us do this, but this is kind of the cultural context in which we're existing, which leads us to the news or the media as uh, we talk about it some, uh, sometimes, because the media is supposed to be our gateway to figuring out what's going ar- around in the world around us. I can't be everywhere at once. I need someone to tell me, hey, what are the facts of what's happening in my community, in my state, in my country, in the world, just so I know what's going on and, and how the world is moving forward. But I believe that our media has been in a state of truth decay that is making us anxious and angry and is making it very hard for us to be a people as a country who are able to take hold of objective truth. Let me give you the big idea and then we'll break it down. This is the way I would describe our current situation. Social and traditional media sources have suffered truth decay because hate and outrage are profitable. That social and traditional media sources have suffered truth decay because hate and outrage are profitable. I'll go through traditional media, I'll go through social media, and then we'll say, okay, what are we supposed to do about the fact that this is existing around us? What does the Bible say? Before I do that, I want to say something real quick. You know, we here at Pine Grove Church don't do a lot of these topical type sermons, and there's a reason for that. My job as the pastor is to teach the Word of God and, you know, applications based on the Word of God. And so if you're new here, this isn't kind of the normal thing of what we're doing. And I will say I'm a little uncomfortable sometimes diving into these issues the way we are, making it a whole sermon. Not because I I don't feel firmly uh, about what the Bible says about these things, but rather it's typically not my job as a pastor to tell you what to think about the world around us. It's what to tell you what the Word of God thinks and how to apply that to the world around us. A big difference. But I will say for this one, I do have a little extra experience with it. Some of you know my background as a TV reporter, that many of the things I'm going to talk about today, I was thinking about and studying in real time, whether studying journalism in high school or college or being my, you know, my six-year stint as a TV reporter. It doesn't make me a media expert. And when I talk about the media, it, it, it does not mean the same thing as when we are talking about the Word of God. But I think I have a pretty good hold of what's going on because of all those years of basically living in that environment, and hopefully that is helpful to us. There's your disclaimer. All right, let's talk about traditional media first. 
Traditional media being radio, uh, newspaper, and television. The most profitable one of those today is television. So mostly I'm going to be talking about television news and more specifically what rose up in the 80s and became extremely popular in the 90s and early 2000s, cable news. The media has never been perfect. There's always been a profit motive for the media. And in fact, Noam Chomsky and uh, his co-author here, uh, Edward Herman, wrote this book in the 80s called Manufacturing Consent. That, that the media would try to kind of hit the broadest swath of the American population. They'd kind of have a debate between two sides, but often it would kind of settle on this, this bipartisan consensus. There are issues with that, but honestly, living today, boy, I long for those days. Because in those days, whether it was network news like ABC, NBC, CBS, the big three, or cable news as that developed, in general, the strategy for these news organizations and newspapers and, and, and radio and all that was to reach the broadest portion of the population possible. And so they couldn't go too far to the left or too far to the right or they would end up offending their consumers and they would go watch somewhere else. They were also kept, kept fairly accountable for the facts. If they got something wrong, it was a problem for these organizations. And that is something I think we miss as well. But something changed. Actually, a couple things changed. The first thing that changed is that on October 7, 1996, the Fox News Channel went on the air. The Fox News Channel, uh, put on by uh, the now billionaire, Rupert Murdoch, uh, had a different strategy towards the news audience because the media had, in general, had a, I would call, based on my perception, a slight liberal bias. They said, we're going to create a news channel that comes from a conservative point of view. Sounds like a great thing. And that's what I thought. I remember when it first came on the air. I remember especially its coverage in the early 2000s of what was happening over in Iraq. And I'm like, all right, competition in the market is always a good thing. But I think, unfortunately, something happened. It caused other media organizations to change how they were treating the news. And so instead of maybe a slight liberal bias, some of these news sources decided to go, well, if there's a conservative uh, news channel, then we need to create the left or the liberal news channel. And that is how the angle of which we're going to view the news. And it kind of pushed Fox News farther to the right, and it pushed liberal media farther to the left. And now you've got kind of two narratives of what's happening in the country. And then 2016 happened, and everyone's brains broke. And if it was bad before that, it got even worse. People on the left lost their minds, and even CNN, who had to be like, hey, I could get at least find out the facts from someone like CNN, a little bit more in the middle than, say, an MSNBC or, or, or Fox News, maybe, uh, you know, went all the way uh, to basically the left side of the political spectrum. And uh, Fox News and other stations like Newsmax, OAN, pick your choice. There's lots of uh, news channels now on YouTube and other places. It got even more hyper-partisan. So much so that it was hard to figure out what was going on. Pastor Yoder said it a couple weeks ago when he preached here. Sometimes I feel like I'm living in two countries depending on what station is on TV. So why did this happen? How did it get so extreme? Now, in preparation for this, I read a, a, a book called Hate, Inc. by Matt Taibbi. He's a, in, now an independent journalist, but was part of the mainstream media for a number of years, covering presidential elections, things like that. Uh, and the book kind of reads as like half informative, half confessional of like, this is what I used to take part in, and I couldn't do it anymore, and now I'm an independent journalist. Um, I almost quoted the whole book for you today, but it is rather... Uh, uh, thick. Um, I liked it so much, although I will warn you if you pick up this book, he is not a Christian. He does not come from a Christian perspective. But what he says about the news, I think, is generally correct, because he had the inside look on it. And this is what he said, that all the commercial actors make more money the more you read or watch. The business, therefore, is geared to keeping you glued to the, the, to the screen. Basically, they want to carry you over to the commercial break so you can view their commercials and so that they can make more money. Listen, it's fine. You know, you can't put on a news station for free. They've got to make money somehow. But the profit incentive was so intense that 
media became more and more intense of their coverage, more and more biased to either the right or to the left to keep glue, uh, you know, viewers glued to their screens, and they became more sensa sensational, more commentary, and less fact-based. If you turn on any of these news channels nowadays, it's almost never headline news. It's always some kind of news commentary show with a bunch of talking heads yelling at each other, right? I mean, if we turned it on right now, I bet that th that's what it would be uh, at, <laughs> at this very moment. <sighs> Seeing such heightened and intense news that's designed to make us anxious or angry so that we keep on watching and keep on watching and keep on watching also makes it very hard for us to figure out how to interact with the world around us. There's so much happening, and because of technology, we've never been exposed in video and in writing to so much human misery around the world. We are exposed to more of the brokenness of the world than we ever have before, and there's something inside of us that wants to do something about us. Another great insight from Matt Taibbi. He says, we, and this is the confessional part of his book, he's talking about we as that traditional media. He says, we create the illusion that being informed is a kind of action in itself. So to wash that guilt out, to eliminate the shame and discomfort you feel over doing nothing as the world goes mad, you'll keep tuning in. And so the general media marketplace becomes increasingly polarized decreasingly based on truth, because the more they could rile us up, the more news we end up watching, which is what happened to me last summer, when I needed to be spending more time in God's Word preparing for a sermon and less time on the news. We don't need that much news. We need a little bit of news, but we don't need that much news. You know, John Stewart, the comedian, once said that, that cable news was created for 9-11, for big emergencies, for things when we need to see images of what's going on around the world, and only a big station like that would have the resources to do it. And I agree with him. I'm glad that CNN and MSNBC, oh, Shane, you can't say that in church. Yes, you can. I'm glad they exist, and I'm glad Fox News exists, because when something explodes, goes wrong, natural disaster, uh, Black Lives Matter protests right at the Capitol, we get images of what is happening live, and we can figure out what is happening on our own. But listen, most days, there's no crisis that should entertain all our minds. So they have to find a crisis. They got to find a crisis somewhere. 24 hours news stations, that's a lot of time to fill. I'm not saying all of it is necessarily nefarious, particularly on the individual level. I know some of the anchors of Fox News. I've worked with them. Um, they're not bad people. All of them. I don't know if there might be some bad people. I don't know. The point is, though, they're not all bad, but they're part of this environment. They've got to put something on the news today that is going to grab people's attention or, hey, your ratings dropped. You're gone. Because that's the name of the game. This has made it so hard for us to know what's true because I feel like whenever I am watching some of this media, I never really hear the whole story. It's either one side or the other. Let me, let me just give you a couple examples. Disclaimer about examples today. Please don't get wrapped up in the example. I have to use something, and because we're in a hyper-polarized environment, every example will boil our blood. There's no example I can use that will all be like, oh, that's fine. Like, there just, just isn't. So, <laughs> disclaimer, don't get caught in the example. I've got to use something. How come I've never heard on all this media, COVID-19 is a dangerous disease, but maybe not all the mitigation steps are wise for human thriving in this country. Why couldn't those both be true? <laughs> Whether you love or hate the vaccine, I'm still waiting to hear, man, the Trump administration and Operation Warp Speed was an amazing program to develop vaccines as quickly as possible with incentives that actually made sense. If, if those drug companies failed, you know how much money they would get from the U.S. government? Nothing. That's unusual in our government today, isn't it? But if, they're, if they succeeded, huge upside for those companies. Amazing program. And why can't we say at the same time, whatever side of the media you're on, boy, 
the Biden administration did a good job making those vaccines that the Trump administration helped develop become available very quickly, that anyone who, got, who wanted a vaccine could get a vaccine just in time for summer. I am waiting to hear some single outlet say maybe both those things are true, right? But we, we just don't hear that. It makes it very difficult for us to determine what's hap- going on around us, and it's making us angry, and it's making us anxious. They have tapped into something dark in the human heart, right? They've tapped into our, our sinfulness, our, our some sinful desire to be angry, to create an other, to join a side and battle someone else, whether it is true or false. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have all become like the one who is is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities are the wind. Take us away. The only righteousness we have is because of Jesus Christ. And the reason these media companies have been successful is not because of always their nefariousness, but because of the darkness of the human heart. They've tapped into that almost desire for us to be angry and anxious all the time. But that's not the way Christians are supposed to live. Psalm 37 verse 8 says this, Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. James 1.20 says, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Colossians 3.8 says, But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Anger and fear are healthy emotions that God has given us. Fear keeps us away from danger. You ever walk to the edge of a cliff and go, oh, 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 oh. You ever have that feeling before? You know what I'm talking about? Like half of you. What, none of you have been near cliffs before? Maybe you're just tougher than me. But anyway, that fear response is good. It keeps me away from danger. Anger, also super useful. If I need to defend my family, it's good for me to get real angry and protect them from harm when they're in danger. But, you read the scriptures yourself. Living in fear or living in anger all the time rots our souls and really demonstrates a lack of trust that ultimately God is in charge. That I have nothing to fear. Over the long term, I should be afraid of the cliff maybe or I should be angry at some wrong and I try to correct it. But if I'm in fear all the time or if I'm in anger all the time, it shows some lack of trust in the one who really does have control over all things. Psalm 27.3, Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though a war arise around me, against me rather, yet I will be confident. And social media is not so different than our traditional media. I know I'm taking a long time here, but um, let's talk a little bit about social media and how it preys on some of our same predilections for fear and anger that we are not to live in as Christians. Um, Social media is a really cool thing. I get to see pictures of what people are going on around the world. I know one Pine Grove church member is always taking pictures of these really interesting birds that are right outside our window. She asked me not to name her. You know who I'm talking about, though. Okay, yeah, yeah, on Facebook, right? It was a cool thing, social media. We could be in contact with people I haven't seen in years and, and celebrate with them their new house or their new baby or their new job. But much like uh, traditional media, there's a profit motive behind social media. Sorry, I got a little bit ahead there. There's a profit motive behind social media as well. Uh, part of my research, I watched a Netflix documentary called The Social Dilemma, which was excellent. Again, not Christian you know, uh, not created to sensitize to Christian audiences, so viewer beware, but uh, interviewed a number of former tech workers who had big concerns about the way these technologies were being developed. And he said, one of them said this, Tristan Harris, a former Google employee, helped design like Gmail and some of those other systems. He said, if you are not paying for the product, you are the product. If you're not paying for the product, 
You are the product. I said there was a profit motive for social media companies, and the profit motive is you. The product is not Facebook or YouTube or Instagram or TikTok or whatever. The product is you. They are selling their viewers, those who use social media, to advertising companies, either selling their data to the advertising companies or advertising directly to us, which means they are incentivized to keep our eyeballs on the screen. The, that, uh, the, the documentary continued on to say this as well. It's the gradual, slight, imperceptible change in your own behavior and perception that is the product. So they get you just to buy something maybe you wouldn't have thought to buy before or, or change your opinion just slightly this way that you didn't change before. This is what advertisers are buying, and it's why these are multi-billion dollar companies in a multi-billion dollar industry. And because the incentive is for them to be, keep glued to our screens, social media is designed to be addictive. In uh, this book called Irresistible by Adam Alter, another one I read in uh, preparation for this, and he does some great interviews out there. They're not hard to find. Um, he studied uh, the idea of social media and its addictiveness. He said this, tech isn't morally good or bad until it's welded by the corporations that fashion it for mass consumption. Apps and platforms can be designed to promote rich social connections or, like cigarettes, they can be designed to addict. Today, unfortunately, many tech developments do promote addiction. And so it's built in right into the way the app might work. If you're on Facebook right now and you scroll down, you know how far you can scroll? You can scroll every hour that you are awake for the rest of your life, and you would never run out. I almost said infinite. Technically, it's not infinite. But you would never run out of things to keep your eyeballs glued to the screen. In many respects, he says further in the book, substance addictions and behavioral addictions are very similar. They activate the same brain regions and they're fueled by some of the same basic human needs, social engagement and social support, mental stimulation, and a sense of effectiveness, meaning we feel like we're taking part in the world around us. The problem is social media is tapped into the same darkness of our hearts that traditional media has. Social media and what you see on it is determined by an algorithm. And sometimes we kind of think of the algorithms as bad, er, evil algorithms. But al algorithms are neutral. Algorithms want to continue to show you the kind of content that you are already seeing. So if all you do is click on cat pictures, all you are going to see on social media is cat pictures. And they're going to try to sell you cat food. They're going to try to sell you cat houses, cat clothes, cat treats, uh, and vegan cat diets which is wrong. <laughs> it's a real thing. It's hilarious. Uh, they're carnivores. Anyway. Um, <laughs> right? But that's not what we tend to click on. We tend to click on, oh, look at what outrageous thing happened today. <gasps> what outrageous thing happened today? Click, 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 click. You wouldn't believe what this person said. <gasps> what did this person say? Eyeballs. Right? Or, look at this person on your team own the other team. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I want to see somebody get owned. Show me that. Show me that, that, that sweet video from Fox News or MSNBC or CNN or whatever. And so what happens is the algorithm's like, oh, these people like material that makes them angry. Or, oh, Shane really likes material that makes him anxious. I'm going to keep on showing him some more of that. And so we get in this feedback loop right? I keep on, I don't mean to, keep on clicking on things that make me angry or anxious, which only feeds more material that makes me angry and anxious. I click on stuff that tends to be on my team, uh, and, and all I'm going to be fed is more stuff that's from my, what the algorithm perceives as my team. And then we end up in this little silo of people who all agree with us, and we're all making each other more angry and anxious, not on purpose, but just a byproduct of this darkness that's built into the human heart. I'm not going to read all the same scriptures again, but the same ones that applied before apply now. 
right? We're not meant to be angry and anxious all the time. That is not what God desires for us for, for human thriving. We can't be people devoted to the Lord and what he has called us to if we are anxious and angry all the time. We need people trusting in him, uh, in his word, in the community of believers, living a life that is holy and a life that is spreading the gospel throughout our land. And that is the way we change the world. But if we become too addicted to social media, if we spend too much time in traditional media, we'll continue to find ourselves anxious and angry because there's been a decay of truth and an addictiveness to feeling angry and anxious all the time that keeps on feeding back on itself. I could sum up the problems that we've found here. One, anger and hate are not biblical ideas for believers. I've already covered that. Two, the current media environment promotes truth decay. And let me just make this, emphasize this with one more example for you before we move on. I want to ask you, and this is, this is you know, I want to ask you, I'd like to see a raise of hands. What countries you think the U.S. is either currently bombing or at war in, meaning we have troops there who are currently fighting? There's no wrong answer here. Um, I'm not, you know, sometimes I feel like pastors are like, hey, raise your hand, and then people raise their hand, and they're like, ha-ha, you're wrong, and people are like, oh, I shouldn't have raised my hand. But <laughs> I'm not going to do that to you, but I would like to see what you think. Uh, and so I'm going to name a couple countries that sound like countries you may or may not be in and see which ones in general we think, because I did this test on myself, uh, which ones we think uh, the U.S. is currently uh, fighting in or, or bombing. Let's name uh, uh, Afghanistan. All right, we're on our way out. That was the easy one because that's actually in the news a lot right now. So, uh, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Pakistan, Libya, Somalia, Niger. The answer is all of them. The answer is all of them. I had no, and I feel like I'm a real smart news consumer. You know, I used to be in the media. No idea. And I look at international news sources. Like, I thought I was doing a real good job figuring out the facts. Woo! That was a shock to me. So you see how there's truth to decay. We don't always know what's happening around us because the things that are on the news are the things that are most partisan, most team-based, and make us anxious and angry uh, rather than just informing us. One last thing, that the last kind of issue with our current media environment, if we're not careful, is that it does actually end up influencing our behaviors in ways that we cannot always predict. Let me give you the example. A number of months ago, there was a big kerfluffle. Is that the word? That's what I want to use. It's in our kids' Bible for some reason. Anyway, uh, it was a big thing about Dr. Seuss. The Dr. Seuss Foundation decided to stop publishing the, some of its books. It was its least popular books. And some of the reasons it gave is say, hey, some of these aren't uh, really appropriate. There may be some racist overtones in some of them. Uh, and Dr. Seuss has some kind of sketchy uh, background with that, actually really before he became a writer. And so the right really reacted, and it was on all the news channels, and it was on my Facebook feed and social media, like, hey, you can't cancel these books. These are good books. And, and yeah, one or two of them, although I didn't see the case for some of them, why they would be racist or something like that, but it, it doesn't matter. The point is people are like, hey, this is bad. We shouldn't be getting rid of these books. This is cancel culture. Go buy Dr. Seuss books. And that's what people did. Everyone went out and bought Dr. Seuss books on Amazon and Target and uh, what was the third one I checked? Barnes and Noble. It was about like the top eight of 10 top books were Dr. Seuss books for a number of days. Uh, and people were like, yeah, we did it. We fought the liberals. Woo! The problem was the company that ended up stopped publishing the books was the Dr. Seuss Foundation. And when people bought all the books, it was the Dr. Seuss Foundation that profited. Which means a company can create a controversy that they then profit from. Now, I'm not actually saying Dr. Seuss was, uh, that was nefarious. I've actually met those people. Uh, they're up in Springfield, uh, Massachusetts, where I used to work in TV, and I've interviewed them. They 
seemed like they did a lot of good work for kids. So I'm not saying that that was their intent. But if someone had that intent, it is not hard to influence us. And sometimes even the good things that come from our hearts uh, to do things that would be against maybe the interests in which we are fighting for. Everyone okay? Good, because we need to say something to ourselves and to each other right now. We're going to say, don't panic. I'm going to count to three. Listen, second service was super loud last week, so you guys, you know, you got to compete here. This is a competition, all right? It's you versus the second service. Just kidding. Um, All right, ready? One, two, three. Don't panic. Listen, don't panic. God is still in control. The world is as crazy as you think, but it's always been as crazy as you think. And the Lord is still working in that craziness until the day he he returns and makes all things new. It's going to be okay. That's the theme of the Bible. It's a mess today, but one day it's going to be okay. But how do we survive in these days where... We need the media to figure out what's going on. We, 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 there's lots of good uses of social media. How do we deal with them? Well, I have three things just like last week. And uh, the first one is actually the same as last week. Number one, humility. We need to be humble about the conclusions we come to. We don't want to immediately react to whatever we hear around us and immediately jump to a conclusion. We need to sometimes give a little time and space uh, to kind of figure out what this news story is all about. Uh, we're kind of being taught by social media and by uh, the talking heads on, uh, on various news sources that, um, that we all need to have this like hot take on what's happening around us. And sometimes we need to do a little more reading or watching. Sometimes we need to kind of let the story develop a little bit before we say, this is what happened, and start spreading that all over the place. Uh, Because rarely do we ever go back and correct ourselves when we're wrong. And if you're me, your first take on something is often not right. Like, more information comes out over time. So we want to be humble about the information we receive, not to immediately act in fear or, or anger, but to slowly be patient and figure things out. Now listen, I know that is hard to do, and, and I am more comfortable, I understand, than most people living in that gray area and being able to say, like, I'm not sure about this, I'm going to wait for it to develop. To develop. And maybe that's because of my past of being in, in journalism and trying to be really spot on and correct, and so being okay saying, like, I'm not sure yet. Um, but it's important for us. Because as James 1 says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of a righteous man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls got to take our time figuring things out. Don't jump to anger. Don't jump to fear. Take a moment. Take a breath, or else we'll respond to each other, which is what this is talking about in James, and to our world with anger and with fear. Second thing I want to say is remember whose side you are on. I have quoted some books today, so let me quote another book for you. That's right, Lord of the Rings. And it's in the book or the movie, so if you've seen both, it's true. Treebeard, (laughs) <laughs> I can't believe I'm quoting Lord of the Rings. That's great. Said this, and it's always resonated in me. He says, I don't know about sides. I go my own way, but you may go with me along for a while. I do not like worrying about the future. I'm not altogether on anybody's side because nobody is altogether on my side. That's important for us to remember as Christians. None of these so-called sides that are being delivered to us is our side. It is not. Uh, And we don't want to make that mistake. Now, it doesn't mean we might lean one way or the other politically. Uh, Maybe we should because we want to be good citizens in the country we live in. And maybe we often vote a certain way. And maybe we should because we want to be good uh, good citizens in the land in which we live. But let's not mistake that this is my side and I'm against that side. Because chances are we might not know that other side. Or I'm on this side and I'm against that side. Ten out of ten. Because we might not really know that side. And these sides may not be for what is most important, and that is for the Lord and for his truth and his worldview, because he is the creator 
of all things. Remember when we were in the book of Joshua? There's this really interesting episode. Let me read it for you. Uh, just before they went to Jericho. And when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where which you are standing is holy. Turns out he's an angel. And Joshua did so. And he, and the, and he said, No, but I am the commander of the Lord's, of the army of the Lord, now I have come. And the point was, this angel appeared to Joshua. Joshua said, are you on our side or are you on their side? And he's like, I'm on the Lord's side. And what's implied there is that we want to remember that we are on God's side. And we need to interact with this side or that side here on this earth. But that is not the way the Lord operates. We want to first be squared with him and then interact with the world around us. Very important. And last, here are Shane's tips for finding your own news source. Because now you may be like, Shane, you want to trash Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, OAN, Newsmax, whatever, blah, blah, blah. All You just made fun of all the things. You said they're all terrible. You said all the social medias are bad. Like, what are we supposed to do now then? Well, here's Shane's tips for uh, for news. And I'm sorry I didn't have slides ready for this, so you'll have to write these down. One, don't just go to one news source. You have to go to a couple. Don't just go to one news source. You have to look at a couple. Uh, my dad is an example of this. My dad, uh, as he's cooking dinner every night, he's got a TV in the kitchen. He, he watches 20 minutes of CNN and 20 minutes of Fox News. And he says, in between those, I could usually figure out what the facts are on a given day. And, and, and form some kind of independent perspective. Because each actually have a lot of value, is, is his point of view. And, you know, I, I tell him, no, Dad. But <laughs> I'm just kidding. It, it's fine. He's, he's balancing news sources. I look at a couple different things. I have a periodical that's based in another country that has an um, a, uh, American edition. Uh, I look at a Christian news source that a, a family here was, uh, gave me a, a prescription to, or a pr- not a prescription to, it might have been a prescription, actually. I think I got it right the first time. <laughs> Pretty good news source. Christian, but, you know, still interested in, in the facts of the day. Not, not every angle is because this person's a Christian. That's why sometimes Christian media, it's hard to get, uh, you know, what's happening in the world around you. But that's pretty good. And then I have a couple independent journalists that uh, I follow. Which then leads me to the next tip. If the tech, next tip is don't just have one news source, have a couple. How do I pick my news sources? And if you f- want to find a really good news source, not only do they sometimes have to have opposing views, which can be helpful, but that you want to go to a news source that corrects and explains when they are wrong. You want to go to a news source that will correct and explain why when they are wrong. This is one reason why I love Matt Taibbi here who wrote this book. Because actually, I don't really agree with where he lands and where most of his conclusions are about the solutions to our country's problems. But I agree with the problems that he cites. And I agree with the, the facts of the case which he cites because when he makes a mistake, he goes back and says, hey, here's the mistake I made, here's the correction, and here's how I made it. And he does so in such a way that I understand the story better. I am benefiting from his original mistake. What is very easy to do in our media environment today is, oh, they got this wrong, but now they're already on to the next story of how, you know, Dr. Seuss is going to ruin your life or whatever it is, right? They're moving on so quickly, they never go back and correct. It makes it very difficult. So among your news sources, find ones that correct themselves and explain how they got it wrong and walk through that whole process with you. It ends up being informative. And last, you don't need to spend that much time in the news. You you need to spend some, maybe. It's good to know what's happening in in our country and the world around you. Causes us to make certain decisions. But you don't need to spend that much time. So Shane, how much is enough time? Listen, I don't know what it is for you. But I said this last week, and I'll say it this week again. If you are spending more time in news than you are in God's word, there is an imbalance of your life, in your life. And there's no other way to correct it. You you know, you develop what you put time into. 
If you're putting time into God's word, and that's more than the time you're putting in news, that's fine. You want to watch, you want to be in God's word eight hours a day and the news seven hours a day. Uh, it doesn't seem like a very healthy sleep cycle. Uh, maybe you should get a job. But, but if you want, that's the, that's the math. You got to spend more time in God's word than you do in the news. Let that be your guide for how much time you're spending in the news. And, and for me, I found out even less, even less time in, in the news. Just enough to know what's going on, then back away, then back away. Those are my tips. If you, if you want them, you can come, come ask me, email me this week. I really appreciate all the emails you've sent to me this time. You know, I started out talking about this topic with you, confessing my fear, ah, fear is probably wrong, my anxiety, let's put it that way, my anxiety and anger last summer. And uh, I bumped into someone here uh, just coming in the church building yesterday as I was on my way out. And uh, she asked me, well, how are you doing now? You know what? I'm doing great. I'm not stressed. I'm not overly angry. So the Patriots do this season, but for now, I'm not. I feel steady. Because I came to the realization that I was doing no good to the world by obsessing over these individual news sources. But instead, as I see the world come at me, I remember what I am grounded in, God's word. And ultimately, if we want to be a people who are involved in changing the world in a positive way, it's not by being filled with anxiety or being filled with anger. It's by building up the body of Christ in the gospel truth and by sharing the gospel with those around us. You want to see the world change? God's already at work. You've got to remember, we're joining God in this world-changing activity this world-changing idea, this good news called the gospel. I'm not anxious anymore. Instead, I am seeing the Lord work in chaotic and difficult situations. I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on what is true and what is good and what he is doing to solve the problems that are around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we are a people we rely on your grace. We rely on your work. And Lord, we need your wisdom. We need your guidance in navigating this media environment around us, Lord. Lord, may we not be a people filled with anxiety or, or, or a people filled with anger. Lord, may you reveal our own hearts to us and show us on those days when we have gone too far and remind us that we're to be trusting in you, not a people that are falling to defining our lives by our anxiety or by our anger. Lord, we need your help. We can't do this on our own. Our heart is, is, is deceitful, but you are not. So by the power of your spirit, we pray that you would work in our hearts and minds to help us discern what is true as you deliver us your truth in your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.